Que... I have to consent to be recorded. I have consented. Ozan had been studying with his teacher for many years and he was going to leave his teacher and continue on his training and his studies with other teachers in China. And before he left, he went to his teacher Yunyan and said, later on, if I am asked to describe your teaching, how should I respond? And Yunyan replied, just this is it. Tozan left him and sometime later was crossing a stream, looked into the water, saw his reflection and realized the meaning of his teacher's final words to him. And upon this realization, he became enlightened. Just this, is it? Just this. It's a beautiful story, like so many of the enlightenment stories, a natural outdoor setting, a tender exchange between a master and a disciple, the intimate simplicity of catching one's own reflection in the water. When I hear this and other enlightenment stories, I imagine that to be a Zen master means that you have gone beyond the cares of the world all passions extinguished, the calm gaze, a demonstration of inner stillness and eternal peace. I have aspired to this notion and felt delighted when friends comment on my serene countenance. Once a friend in AA turned to me at the end of the meeting and told me he felt calmer just from sitting next to me for the last hour. And I received his words as the highest compliment. Just this, is it? I think I have something in common with one of the monks at the monastery Tozan later established. This monk approached Tozan and asked, when cold and heat visit us, how do we avoid them? And the monk was asking, I suppose, how to transcend passions in order to achieve this much desired mind state of peaceful serenity. He was asking in essence, how can I realize the ultimate reality of emptiness so that I can be released from suffering and discomfort? When cold and heat visit us, how do we avoid them? Tozan responds, why not go where there is neither hot nor cold? The monk pressed him, tell me master, where such a place is? Tozan replied, when it is hot, let the heat kill you. And when it is cold, let the cold kill you. Not the answer the monk was looking for perhaps, but it illustrates what I've come to understand as the essence of Tozan's teaching, the Dharma treasure, his teacher Yun Yan brought forth in him, just this is it, just this heat just this cold, just this place, this place, this holy temple we find ourselves in now. What Tozan is pointing to is not a theoretical or philosophical explanation of Zen practice. I, I also don't think he was trying to tease or taunt the monk as much as he was hoping to shake him out of his misguided illusion of avoiding heat or cold or any other worldly phenomena as the goal of Zen. Tozan's response in this exchange is actually quite practical, as ordinary as the slogan on the Y East hoodies, chopping wood and carrying water since 2010. But what of this place where Tozan directs the monk to go? This place beyond heat or cold. That's how Tozan responds. He says, go to the place beyond hot or cold. And the monk says, where, where is that? This place of being killed by heat, of being killed by cold, is the topic of my talk tonight. It is expressed in a set of five brief verses that Tozan composed, which are known as the five ranks. The verses are poems on the dynamic interpenetration of what in Zen we commonly refer to as the capital A absolute and the capital R relative. The absolute being the ultimate reality, sometimes expressed as the three marks of existence, impermanence, interdependence, and no self. The relative referring to the conditioned reality of the phenomena of this world. 
Each of the five poems illustrates an aspect of how these dichotomies of absolute and relative show up in our practice. And here I wanna pause and just define what I mean by practice. I like the definition used by Domio, Domio Burke, the teacher at Brightway Zen Center in Beaverton. She defines practice as in this way, what we consciously choose to do with body, speech, and mind to decrease suffering and increase wisdom and compassion. And I'll come back to that later. Well, as a set, the five poems are referred to, Tozan's five poems are referred to as the five ranks. I don't find the imagery of a rank useful in my own practice with this teaching. I think that the initial context of a rank is as a degree or position. Position is probably closest to my own applied understanding of Tozan's framework. For me, this idea of a degree or a position is and in regards to Tozan's five ranks is like a flavor in my mouth, transient, ephemeral, momentary, vanished in a flash. Each flavor embodies an awareness of how I am relating with and within the interplay of absolute and relative perspectives at any given moment. Tozan's five ranks offer a method of working with our practice our practice, in Domio's words, of reducing suffering and increasing wisdom and compassion. Collectively, they're a practical framework for realizing the place beyond heat and cold, the place where just this is it. Tozan's framework outlines the five distinct, or he outlines five distinct orientations towards this interplay of ultimate and conditioned realities that characterize Zen practice. In the first poem, our orientation is fixed on the conditioned phenomena, AKA the heat and the cold. Another way of expressing the orientation of the first position comes from the first line of Dogen's Genjo Koan. As all things in the Dharma, there is delusion and realization, practice and birth and death, and there are Buddhas and sentient beings. We are aware in this first position, mostly of the relative. And while the absolute reality is not forgotten, it's in the background of our awareness. In Tozan's second poem, the position is reversed and the absolute is foregrounded from the relative. We still experience the heat or cold, but we focus on its impermanence and our own insignificance within the myriad causes and conditions which brought us to this place of extreme heat or cold. Dogen's second line of the Genjo Koan describes the second position as follows. As the myriad things are without an abiding self, there is no delusion, no realization, no Buddha, no sentient being, no birth and no death. In deep meditative states, perhaps after sitting Zazen for hours in the sweltering heat or freezing cold of Tozan's ninth century monastery, we may experience the third position an orientation that transcends all dichotomies. Here we bask in emptiness, or as Dogen writes in the third line of the Get Koan, the Buddha way is basically leaping clear of the many and the one. Perhaps this is the place our monk in the story was hoping to find and to remain. But it is in the fourth of Tozan's five ranks that in my experience, things get interesting. The fourth position of awareness yields a full immersion within the interpenetration of absolute and relative perspectives. In this orientation, I am fully present with all my body and heart for the heat and the cold while steadfastly grounded in an awakened mind state. This fourth poem is sometimes called coming from within both together. And it's not separate from the previous position of realizing emptiness. Returning to Dogen's Genjo Koan, the Buddha way is basically leaping clear of the many and the one. Thus there are birth and death, delusion and realization, sentient beings and Buddhas. Just this is it, just this. And now just this. A Bodhisattva is one who has gone beyond and chooses to remain in the cycle of birth and death until all beings are liberated. 
The Bodhisattva chooses, as Domio emphasizes in her definition of practice, the act of choosing to reduce suffering and increase wisdom and compassion. In my own practice with Tozan's five positions as my guide, I am emboldened by this potential to choose to sit with just this, with whatever is arising in the moment. And now I'll, I'll read one of these five poems. It's a, it's a translation by a, a scholar of um, Buddhism in China named Andy Ferguson. And it's his translation that I've mostly worked with for the last two years, so that's what I'll read. So this is the fourth poem, the fourth rank, the fourth position, the fourth flavor. No need to dodge when blades are crossed. The skillful one is like a lotus in the midst of fire. Seemingly, you yourself possess the aspiration to soar to the heavens. What I take from the fourth position, this orientation toward a deeply embodied integration of the absolute and relative awareness, is serenity that emerges from a fierce willingness, a chosen willingness to fully experience just this. That's what Tozen means when he tells the monk that the place beyond hot or cold is the place where you allow yourself to be killed by the heat, where you allow yourself to be killed by the cold. One commentator on this verse paraphrased Tozen as exclaiming, stop bothering the heat. Let it be, if it's hot, let it be hot. Observe from your seat of active stillness, your conditioned ideas about heat, and then allow those ideas to die off or to be killed as the case may be to fully experience just this. Another way of understanding the relationship between the third and fourth ranks is as Tozan's counsel against what we would call today a spiritual bypass. I love meditative bliss just as much as the next guy, but Tozan and many others teach us that hanging out in emptiness is not the path of Zen. As a boy first exploring the Dharma, Tozan questioned a teacher after reciting the heart of great perfect wisdom sutra, the one we chanted at the beginning tonight. But a youthful Tozan protested, I have eyes, I have ears, I have a nose, a mouth, a body, a mind. So why does the scripture say I have none? This perhaps became Tozan's personal koan as he spent the rest of his life practicing with it. Certainly the poetic framework of the five ranks reflects Tozan's contemplation of how we can experience emptiness through these very human bodies and how that experience yields liberation. I'd like to return to the first two lines of the fourth poem. No need to dodge when blades are crossed. The skillful one is like a lotus in the midst of fire. As I mentioned, it was the fourth rank where I found things got interesting in my practice and study of the five ranks. In this fourth rank practice, the questions I posed in the newsletter blurb for this talk came forth. What emerges when we are willing to go beyond our comfort zones to where it is very hot or very cold? What emerges when we choose to be willing to stay close to just this? So here's my experience. It's hard and messy to sit like a lotus in the midst of fire. It's confusing as hell sometimes. It's as grueling as the first months of night nursing my two children when I never really have more than 90 minutes of sleep in a row. If the third rank has this flavor of sweet, the meditative bliss, I would say the fourth rank has a flavor of bitter. When I truly sit with whatever is arising, I sometimes have a raw fear that I will be destroyed by the feelings. And I'm talking about the intense stuff like heartbreak, but also the mundane moments of being fully present while waiting for Lucy to put her shoes on so we can finally leave. But I can say with utter, utter sincerity, that my experience has been that some quality of my being is transformed by sitting, by sitting with whatever is arising from this ground of meditative awareness. 
the words that come to mind as I try to express what practicing with Tozan's teaching has meant to me are these. I had to fully, without reservation, love what arose. I have to fully, without reservation, love what arises. I first had to really love what was going to be destroyed in the transformation. The parts of me that I allowed to be killed by the heat, killed by the cold. Not a hallmark card kind of love, but a ferocious, sometimes painful love that takes the kind of courage that comes from having your heart broken and choosing to love again anyway. And when I've needed that kind of love in the darker moments, it was the third line of the fourth rank poem that encouraged me. Seemingly you yourself possess the aspiration to soar to the heavens. This kind of compassionate intimacy with myself and all my conditioning has transformed me. I don't have much to say about the fifth and final rank. Honestly, it hasn't really penetrated my practice the way the first four have, but I'll at least mention what the fifth rank is. It's known as arriving within both. It's the orientation of the, the orientation of the final position is one of full integration of the ultimate and the particular, an integration that is beyond just harmonizing. The poetic imagery of the fifth verse is returning to sit in the warm coals and ashes after wishing to escape the ordinary. And the fifth line of Dogen's Genjo Koan corresponds with the fifth rank in this way. Yet in attachment blossoms fall and in aversion weeds spread. I suspect the final poem is akin to the final poem in the 10 ox herding pictures where the practitioner returns from her spiritual journey to dwell in the marketplace, sharing freely with all. I'll close with one last story about Tozan and then a poem from a more contemporary period. So after his awakening, while crossing a stream and seeing his reflection and realizing the meaning of his teacher's final words, Tozan wrote a verse that goes like this. Just don't seek it from others or you'll be far estranged from self. I now go on alone everywhere I meet it. It is now me, I am now not it. One must understand in this way to merge with suchness. That's his enlightenment verse. And it contains a teaching I have come, I have come to know to be true for myself. I now go on alone and everywhere I meet it. And that's been true for me as a sober member of AA for many years now. And I'm grateful for the practice of Zen to bring that teaching forth in a way that has at times been frightening, but also liberating. The truth is I'm at home in my body in ways I never imagined were possible. And so I'd like to end with another poem, this one by a contemporary poet named Rupi Karur. She recently published a beautiful collection of poetry titled Home Body. And I have no idea if she has read and practiced with Tozan Ryokai, but something about this poem makes me suspect that she has. I want to be snapped, cracked, hammered into. I want to open where I'm closed. Find the secret door, let me out of me. I want something to hold me by the neck, split me down the middle and make me feel alive again. I don't want to be numb anymore. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. So I have a question. Is it questions? Is it qu questions? Um, thank you for what a um, such a c c so much clarity on Tozan's five ranks. I think um, 
I think your description really actually made sense in a way that that what I've the little that I've read hasn't made sense. And so I appreciated your personal experiences with it. Waiting for Lucy to tie her shoes, for instance, it really made sense to me. And I'm wondering, it, you said you'd been studying Tozon's five ranks for two years. And I'm wondering what got you hooked on this particular teaching out of all the teachings that the Dharma offers us. What, what sucked you in with this one? Mm -hmm. And I'll say hi, Penny, who just joined us. Um, it was, uh, I was living in residency at Dharma Rain, and um, so I was pretty much on schedule. I wasn't working. And so I was participating in the midday set at 1130. And um, I just had one of those sets that was the third position. It was totally meditative bliss. And I was in a very deep state of concentration. And the last line of the precious jewel mirror samadhi kept kicking around in my brain, the host within the host. Mostly I just let it kind of circle, but anyway, afterwards at lunch, I I brought it up and um, Joshin, Joshin suggested I look at the five ranks. And so I did. And I was hooked as you say. But it didn't make like it didn't make any sense. Like I, I went to the internet, I did the search engine. I'm in Uji, uh, which is the office building over at the temple, and and I'm I'm reading this, and it's just not making any sense whatsoever. So literally, I've spent the last two years sitting with this, which I recommend as a practice because it's been really powerful to return again. I mean, this is this is probably the eighth version of this talk I've written in the last year. And every time it's different, something new is alive and comes forth. And this one I feel like is the last one actually. And I was pleased with how this one came forth. I was curious about something you said about killing off cold and killing off yourself to cold and heat and you said you had to learn to love both cold and heat but isn't the process I, i've personally found it's more the process of allowing yourself to be killed that, that helps rather than trying to love something you don't love does that make sense it makes perfect sense honestly i like i until I really sat down and was working on this version of the talk, I, I hadn't quite appreciated that that's, that is my experience. Like for me, that's kind of the aha of, of doing this, of, of writing this talk is, oh yeah, like I, for me, the, the, the key, like the linchpin, the turning point was when I could really love, really love whatever was arising all the mess, all the fear, all the grief, all the pain, all the joy, all the love, all the boredom, all the ego, all the grasping, all the aspiration to be, you know, perfect, serene cameo, all of it. I had to love all of it. And then I could be killed by it. I hope that answers your question. I think we're just coming at it in a different direction. <laughs> Could you say more about being killed by it? It's very hard to articulate. Hmm. I can tell you that after I have sat with something that is arising, and again, it's the intense stuff and the and the boring stuff. It's both, it runs the gamut. There's something about 
sitting with it and not just allowing, not just tolerating, but really loving, really having deep appreciation and compassion for everything. There's something, something changes. There's something transformative about that. And so I imagine this language of something being killed, like sometimes it's letting go, but more often, as I'm sure you've heard in AA, you know, I got claw marks on most of the stuff I've had to let go of. And, and, and that, I, that I experienced more as something being killed. It's a little bit more violent um, in that way. Um, how much more do I want to say about that? I had been practicing Buddhism since 93 when I got sober, but I came to Zen in November 2016, a couple days after Donald Trump was elected. And I had an experience on retreat and it felt like that was how I was going to sit with the violence. It, to be political, but like for me, it was violent that a sexual predator was elected president. And so for me at that time, sitting Zazen every day and joining a Sangha and showing up was the appropriate response to my own trauma around who was elected president. Isn't the, um, oh. isn't the path, isn't the practice to transform rather than kill? I think my experience with the five ranks is that it, this particular teaching offers me direction, a guide on, um, kind of very practical choices I can make to achieve transformation. I will just say like, as a side note, I'm not necessarily looking for transformation. I got sober to stop drinking. I started sitting to sit. So, um, the transformation piece has been a little bit of a surprise, even though I hear people talk about it. But unfortunately, Ed, my experience, particularly in the past year, is that something gets killed. There's a part of me that is killed. And sometimes it feels like murder. Um, but truly, the back end is... a. Um, something different. Um, Kenya, thank you. It was, very, it was a really beautiful talk and uh, you put so much of yourself into it. Um, and I, I, I really like this idea of being killed by the heat and cold because the, the body sat far is always prepared to be sacrificed and sacrifice themselves. So like at Borobudur, you know, like there's all the beautiful imagery of um, in from the various lives of the Buddha, where the Buddha just would jump into the pot as a rabbit so that uh, Indra could eat. You know, there's this real sense of, um, of the body sat for being able to to lovingly sacrifice themselves and not just um, lovingly or with compassion, but there's this sense of really incredible altruistic joy, um, which occurs. So 
for me, I just think that's just so beautiful, you know, like, and it's a real um, interesting, for me, it's a really interesting statement because often we feel, think about being killed by something as, oh, you know, like being killed as by a person or being killed by an incident. But the idea of being killed by heat and cold is just so arbitrary in a sense. It's so at the extreme and how do you stop that? How do you deal with it? So uh, thank you. I mean, I, I, I thought it was really a beautiful talk and thank you. Thank you, Peter. I think that's what Tozan is saying is that um, we experience heat, we experience cold, let it be, yeah. Yeah. but be with it. Yeah. Cameo, thank you so much. It was just uh, an amazing talk. I'd like to just hear a little bit more about when you were talking about you have to love it all. You had to love it all, every drip of it before you could get to the point of the killing. And there were things that were popping up that was like, yeah, but do you have to love the anger? Do you have to love, um, you know, all, all of it? I mean, I can see some of it, but there was things that were like popcorning up going, well, I don't know if that I could ever get to the loving that part when I'm feeling really extremely angry or passionate or um, about something. So I guess I'd just like to hear a little bit more about how you got to that point. Like you just had to get to that point for all of it before you got to that other place. I think in, in part, when, when Tulzan is suggesting that I let the heat kill me, and I, I do love Domio's definition of practice and this, this choice to reduce suffering, it's so in that moment when I feel overwhelmed or swept away or bored as hell, there is this what, what I learned from practice is that there is this moment of choice to be aware of what is here. And, and the second part, which is, I think your question, and this is the part that I really didn't get for years, I would say. Um, like self-compassion, self-love is not messing around. Like self-compassion is fierce and there is a tenderness to it, but it's a choice. And my experience is that um, some of what I've sat with over the years is scary and difficult. And so it, it wasn't like in AA, we have this expression about not white knuckling it, which means like, don't like white knuckle not drinking. You, you, in AA, anyway, you, the point is to have a spiritual experience, a spiritual transformation. And um, so my experience is that white knuckling, trying to white knuckle through just this, whatever this is, um, is not a path of liberation or transformation. It's a path of suffering for myself and then others. So loving it, Chan, doesn't, I don't know how to explain it. It's, um, I, I can just tell you that for me, it feels not, at this point, it feels non-negotiable. There, there are times where it doesn't feel like a choice. It's just, it's just the appropriate response given what is arising. And I, I, I will say as a side note, I think I'm a better mom actually the last couple of years, uh, having sat on every day and loving whatever came up because some of my kids bring something to me that, you know, I think is kind of bullshit. I, I love it anyway, cause I, cause I can love myself. It sounds trite, but it, there's nothing trite or weird or mushy about it. It's ferocious actually.
Kim, you know, a lot of your imagery is warrior-like, ferocious, and and um, I think you used the word violent, and this is your your um, the impression you know that I get is this rising up. Um, I don't know against stuff. I'm sure that's not what you mean, but um, so is that is that does that come from the five ranks? Is that embedded in there? Is that your per? Is that your response? You know, to it. That's not a very clear question, but um, I'm just wondering because I. I Myself tend to um, look for gentleness, <laughs> you know, having lived a fairly violent life, and and so I, I'm just curious about that. So there's this great line in the Perfection of Wisdom in Ten Thousand Lines, and I'm I'm going to butcher it, Trisha. Maybe you can jump in if you're so inclined. There's this line about how the the Bodhisattva um, has the armor of no armor. Jushin, am I getting that pretty close? And, and I love that image of like, you know, the, the translator used the word armor, which suggests a need to defend the self against something or someone. But the Bodhisattva has the armor of no armor. The Bodhisattva has wisdom and compassion and tenderness and fierceness. It takes guts, man, to come back to experience meditative bliss and say, actually, you know what? I'm going to hang out and I'm going to be with all beings until all beings are liberated. That takes ferociousness, I think. But the armor is no armor. The armor is love. The armor is compassion. The armor is active stillness. Looking at a wall and following the breath. So we're at time. Is there any, do you have any last words, Kimio, before the closing verse? Thank you for listening. Thank you for inviting me to give this talk, Joshin. And do you know the closing verse or would you like me to say it? Can you say it, please? The universe is as a boundless sky, just as the lotus is not wetted by the water that surrounds it, the mind is immaculate and beyond the dust. Let us bow to the highest Lord, all Buddhists throughout space and time, all honored ones, bodhisattvas, mahasattvas, wisdom beyond wisdom, maha, rajna, paramita. Feel free to unmute and say goodnight. Thank you. I hope I'm inspired. I hope other people Thank you. are too. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, that was beautiful. Lovely. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's Good night, lovely. everyone. Night. So sorry I got here late. Yeah. But it's, it's recorded. Wonderful talk. It's wonderful. <laughs> It is recorded. I think so. Yes. yes.